Hello, Global Gardeners. Great to see you here on another Monday, one of the most important days in our gardening year. It's the first full day of spring here in the Northern Hemisphere. And it also is the day when we know that summer is over in the Southern Hemisphere. Great to see you all here. Prepper Chris is back with us after having missed it for a while. And as Pat and Frank have already commented just down the road from me here in Colorado, it is a cold, blustery day. I'm not sure if you can hear the wind howling outside my window, but it's about 50 miles per hour right now and cold and snowy. A wonderful start to spring. I know some of you have commented that you're actually already seeing spring, so that's fantastic. Enjoy it every day you can because for some of us, it's going to be a few weeks before we get to that point. Today, we're going to be talking about bugs, insects in your garden, and some of the ways that you can deal with them. And I think, more importantly, some of the ways that we can live with them. So there will be philosophy thrown into all the information coming your way. Nice to see everybody. There's Bobby Wilson checking in. Good morning to you as well. Blue Roses, Diane F., good morning, nice to see you here. Llama Llama, happy spring. Planted two tomatoes, or still can't plant tomatoes for two months, but I'm still very excited. And so I've already started my pepper seeds indoors, and it's about two months before I can put my tomatoes in the ground, but I'll be actually starting my tomato seeds later this week. So it's all about patience. It's putting those seeds in a little pot and hoping that they'll get to the point that you can actually get them outside in two months. And I know some of you have already got those plants out in your garden, so good for you. I think that's wonderful. And that's why we can all share this information because we're at different rates in our growing season everywhere that we are, but there's always good info to learn. Laura's saying hello from Northern Montana. Looking forward to to learning how to deal with flea beetles, <clears throat> the number one enemy in the garden. And so let's go ahead and start here because I think that's a real good point that Laura is identifying right off the bat. Flea beetles, that's the first step. Whenever you have an insect enter your garden, don't automatically assume that it's a bad bug. Find out about it. Find out what the insect is because you might be surprised to find out it's a good bug. Years ago, when I was uh, very active in the Master Gardener program, part of that meant that we would be at the help desk, an actual desk that gardeners could call into or stop by to ask questions and, and get answers to make their gardening easier. And I remember one woman in particular coming in and she had called ahead and said she had this bug and she was trying to get rid of it. And we, we always ask what kind of bug it is. And so she didn't know. And we said, well, if you can capture one and bring it into the help desk, we'll help you identify it. And so she brought in in a, in a little uh, bag, uh, this little dead bug and said, I have these all over my plants and I need to get rid of them. Well, it turns out what it was, was ladybug larvae. And ladybug larvae are among the most voracious insects in your garden. They will eat a huge amount of aphids and other insect pests. And so the problem is that the ladybug larvae is pretty ugly. It looks like it's a bad bug. So she was doing all she could to get rid of one of the best bugs in the garden. So the first step when you think you have an insect problem is to identify the insect. Because you may find out that it's not a problem at all. That it's actually a great thing for your garden that you have that particular insect. And so I'll go ahead and mention right now, because you're going to ask this question, I always get asked this question, how do you find out what kind of insect it is? Well, one of the sources I use is, an, is a phone app, and it's iNaturalist, like iPhone, the letter I, Naturalist. And it's a wonderful 
app that allows you to take a picture and then it does a pretty good job of identifying whatever it happens to be and it's it's it it's usable for plants as well as insects and if you've got something similar if you have an app or some way that you use please go ahead and share it in the comments with the rest of us but iNaturalist is one that works pretty well and you take a picture it tells you what the bug is and you may realize that it's not a problem at all so first step right off the bat don't assume every bug is bad in fact when you look at the numbers it's actually only a very small percentage of insects that we would consider harmful pests in our garden the large large majority of insects are either neutral very little impact on our garden or beneficial so there's step one in this process of dealing with the bugs in your garden and that's identifying them okay let's see fish north dakota chick says have a lot of snails are there other animals that eat them absolutely <clears throat> in fact um, depending on how much space you have and and uh, particularly if you're on a homestead or you have a, a large property ducks are incredible animals as far as snails and slugs so uh, get yourself some duck ducks if you have a big snail problem uh, raccoons oh, there's a lot of those type of animals that will eat the, the snails and the slugs snakes will also eat so yes to answer your question there are a lot of animals that will be eating the snails and the slugs in your garden okay let's see yeah Spencer is actually raising a really good point and I did want to talk about this a little bit later but let's go ahead and talk about it right now <coughs> uh, soil and so I've mentioned this a, a number of times in the four before Colorado State University has done some studies and they report that more than 80% of plant problems can be attributed to the soil. And so as Spencer says, a soil test can really help you tackle an insect problem, micronutrient deficiency, too much nitrate, not enough calcium will all attract, pe attract pests to weak plants. And so it really does come down to the soil. A good soil makes for a good strong plant and those insect pests that are going to attack our plants are going to attack the weaker plants first it's just like the plains of the Serengeti where the lions are going to attack the weakest animals in the herd first they're not going to attack those big strong adults because the big strong adults fight back it, it believe it or not works the same way with plants the, those pests are going to attack the plants that can't fight back because most plants have defenses against pests. Good soil means your plants are going to be stronger. So absolutely excellent point, Spencer. Thank you for pointing that out. That, 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 and, and I say this all the time, soil is key to a successful garden. And so we often think of that as, as meaning that you're going to get more flowers or you're going to get more fruit or you're going to get bigger roots or the plants going to grow taller all that is true but it also means that the plant is going to be able to fight off not only the pests but diseases as well so we'll be talking more about soil as we move through my springtime and i do some of these efforts to improve my soil and i'll share all that with you and of course i've got a number of videos that talk about those things as well but key soil amending preparing and that's one of the things that you can do to actually reduce some of the pests in your garden it really is pretty incredible how it all works together it's brian is saying most universities have an entomology department you can mail samples to for identification at least i have used them here in madison wisconsin thanks brian that's actually a really good recommendation and I know Colorado has that as well. And, and so we, you know, I've talked about the Master Gardener program before. In the United States and Canada, we have the Master Gardener program. So there's, there might be a help desk in your town to, to take uh, a specimen two for identification. But to Brian's point, 
The Master Gardener programs are overseen by state universities, and those state universities have the resources that we Master Gardeners are actually relying on. And you can kind of bike past the middleman and often contact the department uh, directly. So really good suggestion. And it, it's uh, knowledgeable gardeners are, are also a good resource. So, so you've got your university, you've got your phone apps, you've got your master gardeners, and then you've got the, those old gardeners like me that might be in your neighborhood. If you're new to gardening, get involved with that kind of community. Reach out and try to find some of those gardeners. I just had my gardening club meeting this last Saturday, had a lot of new members showing up, asking a lot of basic questions. And, and these new members are actually new gardeners, which is why they're asking some of these basic questions. And I wasn't the only one with the answers. A lot of the people who have lived in, in my particular area longer than I have had better answers than I did because they've gardened every season for 20 years. And so they know the soil problems and the pest problems and the weather problems. And so that's another great resource. If you've got a bug and you just aren't sure how to deal with it, if you have a network of local experienced gardeners, they might be able to help you out right off the bat as well. So, so get those resources, identify that bug, and it's definitely going to help you out. Okay, here's a good one from Tammy. Google Lens is pretty good at telling me what a bug is. Just snap a picture and hit the square and it will search for what you took a picture of. <coughs> Thank you. I haven't used Google Lens, so uh, I'll, I'll definitely do that. I think that's a, an awesome example. Blue Roses Diane F. I'm growing a bird garden this year to help with pests, and I know some will also eat my plants, so growing some veg crops to sacrifice for them. So now let's go back to that original question that uh, I, I said I would get to. So when you have uh, flea beetles, uh, it is one that I use this technique for. Flea beetles can be difficult to, to deal with. They don't typically cause large scale destruction. They're an annoyance. They can affect the plants. But I've found that some plants are more susceptible to flea beetles than to other plants. And so this is a great way to approach the pests in your garden is what Blue Roses Diane is saying. Sacrifice. And, and I've talked about this before. Planting the sacrificial plants. So if you want to grow turnips, for instance, my turnips attract flea beetles. I should say some of my turnips attract flea beetles. And so in an effort to grow turnips, I'll grow turnips in three different beds in different areas of the garden. And if one of them becomes infested by the flea beetles, I just kind of let it go because that's the weakest of all of those turnip plants. And so while the flea beetles are focused on the weak plant, all the other plants are pretty much left alone. You'll find an insect pest on those other plants, but they're just kind of in search mode. They separated from the group, and those are usually pretty easy to deal with. Now, I have a video and I've talked about integrated pest management before. And the idea behind integrated pest management is, is developing a system, an integrated system of steps in dealing with or managing the pests in your garden. And it's not at all about using poisons or pesticides, though that can be a step in the management of the pests. And so while I don't like to use pesticides, I do recognize that for some gardeners in some regions, pesticides are the way to deal with some of these pernicious pests that you really can't get rid of in other ways. But through integrated pest management, you basically follow a, a, a series of steps, a series of different ways to manage the insects and the chemical pesticides are at the are the last step they're at the end of the line so it begins with the identification recognizing whether you even have a problem 
And two of the methods that I tend to use most often, and, and this is, is separate from the sacrificial plant, but using mechanical methods or, or cultural methods is, is what it's referred to in integrated pest management. And so as we enter the springtime or as we enter fall, because the last time you saw this in my garden was actually in the background of, of some of the videos I did about the fall garden. And that's to cover your plants. When I sow seeds in the ground or put seedlings in the ground, depending on the plant, if it's susceptible to a particular type of pest, I'll put my hoop over that bed and then cover that hoop with a fabric row cover. And that is a great way to keep some of these insect pests out. It's a barrier to keep them away from the plants. So right there, if you have vine borers, for instance, if a lot of these, these pests start off as an adult that lands on the plant, lays the eggs, those eggs hatch, and then the larva will either burrow into the soil or burrow into the plant to cause damage later on. Well, when you begin understanding the life cycle of these insects that you've identified, a simple barrier, a simple row cover over your plants when they're young will keep those adult insects from even finding your plants and laying the eggs and they'll go someplace else, not your garden. So that's, that's a great way. I use that uh, with a lot of my greens and, and so that bed that, that I, I showed in a couple videos last year, I had no pest damage on the turnips and the lettuce and the broccoli and the mustard and all those plants I was growing together in that bed. Because they had been covered by that row cover, no insects got to them. And don't think that you need to have your plants open and available to pollinators. Because when we talk about broccoli and lettuce and mustard and turnips and beets and Swiss chard, those are all plants that we're harvesting the roots or the stems or the leaves. So we have zero need for pollination of those plants, which means you can cover those plants from the day that you sow those seeds, keep them covered during their entire lifespan, just lifting up the cover to harvest the leaves or the stems or the roots as needed, and you won't have any insect problems because the insects just can't get to those plants. So recognize how your plants are growing and what you're trying to get from the plants. And, and there's an outstanding way to just never have a disease or not a disease, a pest problem, but it also holds true for diseases. Keep them covered the whole time. And, and a light row cover fabric still lets the sun in, still lets the rain in, still allows you to manage your plants with no damage to the leaves. So uh, the stuff I, I grow when I use that method actually looks better than a lot of what you find at the store. What you find at the store, the reason all that produce looks so beautiful is because they spray it with pesticides to keep the bugs from eating the leaves. You can do the same thing with no pesticides at all. The next step that rolls into to a, a mechanical method, something that you actually do to deal with those bug pests, is to pluck them off. And, and so I'm, no doubt you've seen that you should carry around a, a bucket or a pail or a, a jar of soapy water and you pull the bug off and drop it in and it drowns. Yes, that works. I just don't like carrying around a bunch of soapy water, so I squish it in my fingers. If, you, if it doesn't bother you to kill a bug by squishing it, you can bypass the soapy water. But the concept is exactly the same. When I have the, the flea beetles or the pirate bugs or the squash bugs or anything else that's attacking my plants, as soon as I see it, I grab it and kill it and then toss it off to the side. You could do the same with the soapy water if you have more of those bugs. That's a good way to stay on top of it. So if you've got your sacrificial plant off to one side of the garden that most of them are feeding on, 
every time they venture out to find another weak plant, you're at the guard and plucking those those insects off the plants and keeping them from establishing a foothold on that new plant. So there's a couple methods right there. Okay, let's see what else we have that's been popping up here. Um, Kimberly says flea beetles. That sounds terrible. They, it, it's actually a really cool insect. It's really small. It's, it's dark black. It's shiny. It actually looks really cool. So I, I think they're kind of fun. Urban Chicken Mama says, I heard nasturtium is a good plant to deter away from my, my veggies. And so uh, you may have heard me talk about this before. Absolutely. I, I grew nasturtiums in the greenhouse at the Galileo Garden for that reason. And so it was the 42 foot dome greenhouse with two doors and we had arbor set arbors set up around the each of the doors on the inside and up those arbors I grew nasturtiums and and it was it was a magnet plant for attracting primarily aphids aphids really like nasturtiums and so it's it's a magnet plant for a lot of those pests and they're going to attack the nasturtiums before they attack a lot of those other plants, especially right there at the door of a greenhouse. But you can do the same thing in your garden. I, I like to grow nasturtiums uh, up the trellises that I'm growing my tomatoes on. And it's a wonderful plant. Every part of a nasturtium is edible. And so just for the beauty of the plant, it's great. Because if you don't have pests, that's a beautiful plant. And the leaves are edible and the leaves are pretty. And if you do have pests, yes, go ahead and grow those nasturtiums. And that's one good way to keep those pests away. One thing I saw, I did a trip to France years ago and was touring some of the vineyards. They'll plant rose bushes in the grape or near the grape vines for the same reason. That a lot of the pests that would be attacking the grape vines will attack a rose first. And so you may not think of a rose as a, a, a magnet plant or a sacrificial plant, but it's all relative. If you are trying to grow roses for the beautiful blooms, then you might have a different type of plant to keep the pests away from the roses. But if you're trying to grow grapes because that's your business, then you would be planting the rose to attract those pests away from the grapes. So, you can see it all comes down to what you're trying to grow and what you're trying to protect in deciding what kind of plants you're going to use. But yeah, nasturtiums, absolutely wonderful choice. Hey, Pat, nice to see you. I, hear, I saw your post about it is a pretty crazy weather here in Colorado. It was so nice and beautiful and warm yesterday. And now it's cold and snowy and Pat's just down the road. Sticky stuff on yellow plastic cups worked wonders in my garden last year. Yeah, good. And so that's that's on my list. That's actually one of the uh, mechanical and cultural methods of, of controlling some of the pests. I use the, the sticky traps and you can find them all over. I get mine off of, of Amazon. I think I actually have a link to them in my video about integrated pest management. But you just put... put a this what i use is a a sticky piece of paper that's yellow and the insects land on it and it's trapped but uh pat's exactly right you can do this yourself with yellow plastic cups and so if you use like petroleum jelly like vaseline you can actually smear that on a yellow cup a yellow plastic cup put that in your garden and the color yellow will attract pests now there are other pests as well so uh, you can find blue sticky traps. And so you've probably seen the solo plastic cups, the party cups, and they come in blue and yellow and red. Those are all great colors for attracting insects. And that could be uh, kind of a do-it-yourself method is to take those plastic cups and put something sticky on the outside of it. And you've just made yourself a bug trap. And great way to deal with a lot of these pests. Thanks for that suggestion, Pat, because it really is another good mechanical method of dealing with the pests and not having to rely on the chemical method. And actually, uh, it, it's often more effective than the chemical controls that we use. When you use a pesticide in your garden, it's, it's gonna kill insects. It's gonna, it, and it, we call it a pesticide, it's an insecticide 
and it's killing the insects. And it, it's pretty widespread. You put an insecticide in your garden to kill flea beetles, it's also going to kill ladybugs. That's just the way it's going to work. And that's why I tend to want to stay away from those type of pesticides because they're indiscriminate. They're going to kill anything that's out there. But when you're dealing with these traps, ladybugs are not going to be attracted to those yellow sticky traps. That's not what they're after. And so you can really target some of these pests when you learn more about trapping the specific pests and matching the color to the pest and also the time of day or the time of year to put the trap out because a pest is not necessarily going to be there every day of the gardening season. The adult lifespan of many of these insects might only be a few weeks, maybe a few months. And so that's a critical time that you might want to put out some of these traps to get the adults before they can lay their eggs and start a whole new generation of pests. So uh, Janice Cottle is saying, I used to sticky strips, but it also caught the poor lizards. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I had to save them several times and finally took the strips down. And so I, I actually, uh, and I think in a couple of my videos, you can kind of see it in the background last year. I hung my sticky traps from the hoops. So I had the hoops over my beds and I hung the sticky traps from the top rather than from the, the bottom or near the soil surface. So uh, yeah, that's a good warning. I appreciate that, Janice, that, that there are other beneficials like the lizards. Lizards are amazing. I mentioned snakes earlier. Lizards just devour the insects in a garden. So if you've got geckos, lizards of any type, by all means, you should uh, entice them to come to your garden and eat the bugs because now granted they'll they'll eat some of the good bugs but but it's it's interesting that the way good bugs live versus the way bad bugs live that the snakes and the lizards in particular are more likely to be eating the bad bugs than the good bugs so uh that that's that's a really good choice felicia's wondering how to kill grasshoppers and so uh, grasshoppers are one of those kind of things that it, it's really hard to kill a grasshopper because they're moving. And so if you want to kill a grasshopper, you almost have to use a pesticide on a plant you know they're going to eat. And it has to be a, a pesticide that that will kill the grasshopper after having eaten that plant. And there are some effective pesticides like that out there. It, it works with, with uh, caterpillars as well. Those type of insecticides that you put on the leaf of a plant expecting that the grasshopper or the caterpillar is going to eat that leaf and then ingest that poison to kill the insect. That's about the only way that you can actually kill a grasshopper. What I do is attract birds. I, I attract birds to my garden and about 90% of bird species will eat insects during the nesting and hatching phase of their chicks. And so while it, it's actually a much lower percentage of birds that are eating insects on a regular basis, at least during the nesting cycle, I've got my bird houses up and my, my uh, branches on the ground and my protected areas and my water sources and all those things to try to attract birds to the garden because birds are a great predator of grasshoppers. And you, you may have seen it. You may have seen that, that American robin with the grasshopper in its mouth going back to its nest. Very common sight. A lot of birds will do that. So that's how I tend to deal with the grasshoppers in particular is attract the, the birds to deal with them. Now, those pesticides that you're going to put on your leaves for the grasshoppers and for the caterpillars are not as likely to harm the beneficial insects because the beneficial insects are not eating the leaves. So if you have a really bad problem with those kind of pests, 
look into those specific controls and that might be a good way to do it. Made Gray Wolf is saying my chicken run around eating bugs. There you go. Same idea. Chickens, a bird, they like eating those bugs. So if you got the chickens, let them run around. They'll definitely take care of it. Okay, let's see. We're rolling right along. Stony Gardener says cucumber beetles have been my garden nemesis. And this is one of those where I was talking about breaking their life cycle. Uh, the nice thing about the cucumber beetles is you can see them and you can pluck them off the plant. They will try to, to get away from you. But if you can break up their life cycle by keeping the adults from laying the eggs, then you're not going to have as big a problem with the, with the cucumber beetles. And, and, and I've seen it happen. At, at the Galileo Garden, we did that. It helps to have a lot of students that can come out and pluck the bugs off the plants. But by, by putting the flowers in our garden, by putting the ornamental grasses in the garden, by growing a lot of herbs, we were able to attract those beneficial predators. And those predators took care of most of the pests in the garden. Now, there aren't a lot of predators for something like the cucumber beetles, but the, the, the idea is that if you don't have pests that you used to have because the beneficial wasps are taking care of them, now you can focus your attention on something like a cucumber beetle that is harder to get under control. And so you're not worrying about the aphids because the ladybugs and the lace wings are taking care of them. And you're not worried about the harlequin bugs because you're using sacrificial turnip plants. Now you can focus on something that you really are worried about, like the cucumber beetle. And so think of it as a prioritization and using different methods for different pests. And then you deciding what you spend your most, most of your time on as you're you're trying to eradicate some of the pests that might be out there. Oh, it looks like Tony from Simplify Gardening has checked on. Welcome, Tony. Nice to see you here today. Always nice to have you here, a channel that we talk about often. That's that's wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, the, the, the philosophy, one of the philosophies I wanted to share about the, the pest control is that even though, like, the, the cucumber beetles and and you know, we have a beetle named after Colorado of course and so you've got potato beetles you've got squash vine borers you've got all kinds of these these insects that have become famous because they can devastate a garden that's that's what I like to focus on the ones that are going to do the most damage the flea beetles I really don't worry that much about the pirate bugs I really don't worry that much about the aphids not a big deal i've got a ton of ladybugs in my garden there are a lot of those kind of pests that i just let live because i'm in the process of trying to get a a, a garden in equilibrium where for every bad bug there's a good bug and almost a year ago at the beginning of the season last year I mentioned that I had a current bush that was actually outside my main garden area, absolutely infested with aphids. I don't know that I've ever seen that many aphids on a single plant. And it, it's, I didn't plant it, it came with the house. It's in a bad area for currants to grow, which is why it's a weak plant and why it makes sense that it would be infested by aphids. I did nothing to deal with those aphids. And within the week, that plant was covered by ladybugs. And the ladybug larvae were feasting on the aphids. And about another week later, there were almost no aphids left on the plant. And the ladybugs were gone. Where did they go? They went to my main garden area in search of more food. So that's my basic philosophy. Don't deal with it because nature will deal with it. When you can get to that equilibrium point in your garden, you just let it happen and it does happen. And that's what happened at the Galileo garden, why we had so few pests, because everything started working together. Now, that being said, until you can get to that point, that's why my valuable time in the garden really needs to be focused. 
and I'll focus on those pests that I know can do more damage and, and then deal with those. For instance, the caterpillars. And we had an infestation of caterpillars inside the greenhouse at Galileo, and that was my primary focus for days. Whenever I would have students, we would be in the greenhouse pulling off the caterpillars from the plants, that mechanical method to deal with that insect pest. I wasn't going to let them devour the plants, and they were devouring overnight many of the plants, so we had to stay on top of it. You can use a lot of natural controls, and one of the best is BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. And BT is one of those, those pesticides that you put on the leaf with the intent of letting that pest eat some of the leaves. And so the Bacillus thuringiensis is, is a bacteria that when it gets into the gut of the, the caterpillar, just destroys it. That is one way where you do have to sacrifice some of your plants and allow the bacteria to, to kill off the caterpillars. And it takes a little bit of time and you'll need to reapply the BT after a rainstorm or, or if you water the leaves, it's, it's, it's likely to wash off, not a big deal. But you can find a number of different types of BT for different types of pests. And the one for the caterpillars is particularly efficient. And so when, we, when I talk about like for the grasshoppers and the caterpillars earlier, talking about using pesticides, it doesn't necessarily need to be a manufactured chemical. There are natural ways to deal with the same pests using a pesticide like BT that only the bad bugs are going to ingest. But you do need to target because not all of these bad bugs are going to be ingesting the leaves that you're putting the, the BT on. So look into BT a little bit as a, uh, a, a cultural and organic way to deal with some of these pests. And actually works pretty well. I actually I actually used a different type of BT last year because in my little uh, water pond that I had built for the wildlife for the butterflies and the bees and the birds, I had mosquitoes show up because I just happened to get a new dog and the new dog liked to chew on the solar powered panel wiring that supplied the pump. So the pump shut down, the water wasn't flowing and I had mosquito larvae in that nice little water basin. They sell little discs of Bacillus thuringiensis, but a type that will kill the mosquito larva. I put that in, in two days I had no indication of the mosquito larva in that water. So look into those kind of methods as well. There can be some really effective bacterial controls for some of these pests, and the way they work I think are just absolutely incredible. And so Mage Gray Wolf raises a good, good point. That mention of caterpillars reminded me I wanted to plant milkweed for monarchs. And so monarch butterflies, uh, they, they really are dependent. They need milkweed plants. And so I've got about a dozen milkweed plants and I've actually got some more started downstairs that I'll be putting in for that purpose as well. And this is why indiscriminate spraying really can be harmful because the monarch butterflies are going to lay eggs on the milkweed and the milkweed larvae, the caterpillars, are going to eat the leaves of the milkweed. So you are intentionally sacrificing the milkweed leaves so that the caterpillar can grow into a monarch butterfly. If you just indiscriminately spray a, a a pesticide, an insecticide against caterpillars, you might be killing something that's really nice to have, like the monarch butterfly. And even using BT, I would use BT on my tomato plants and make sure I took every effort that none of that BT was sprayed on my milkweed plants. Because I love the idea of getting rid of the tomato hornworm, but I don't like the idea of getting rid of the monarch butterfly caterpillar. So there's a balance there. It's okay to get rid of some of the caterpillars 
it's also okay. That's why I talk about the system in equilibrium where I allow a lot of the caterpillars to eat my plants because I like seeing the moths and the butterflies in my garden. So you have to decide which, which part of that spectrum you want to be on and how free you're going to allow nature to be in your garden. I like having nature in my garden. So uh, since we're, we're talking about this from Mage Grey Wolf, let's go ahead and talk about the background today because this actually comes from Mage Grey Wolf. Thank you for sending me this picture. If you want a photo of your garden as a background, send it to me at Gardener Scott at GardenerScott.com. Gardener Scott at GardenerScott.com. And do be sure to give me permission to use it as my gray, gray, gray wolf did. And then I'll be able to put it on the background of the show. And so uh, the, the key point of this is not only because it's all nice and green, living in a, a nice zone that you can grow things most of the year uh, is this area right here. Now I've shown it in a few of my videos and I've talked about it. You don't need to garden using metal beds or constructed wooden beds or anything fancy. This is just a fallen tree. You can see the big trunks and all the plants growing inside of it. What a great idea. A great way to frame your garden is to use the logs and the branches and whatever you have at hand. I show that in my lasagna gardening video where I framed a small bed with much smaller branches than these logs. But that's, that's a great example of how you don't need to spend a lot of money building up your garden. You can actually have, you could look at, look at the height of this. If you fill the inside of that with soil, you now have a raised bed that looks to be 18 or 20 inches deep. And you haven't had to buy any lumber. You haven't had to construct something with galvanized steel. You just have some logs and you make a bed with it. So I appreciate you sharing this picture with it, with us. And I think it's a great idea. And it's nice to be able to see some of the plants in forage and things like that that are growing in the background. So uh, that's fantastic. Had, <coughs> excuse me, add that to your bag of tricks. If you have trees coming down or you know somebody that is nearby a neighbor that's going to have some trunks, they weigh a lot. You're going to need some help. Depends on the size, but make a garden out of it. Make some garden beds out of it. And that's a, a wonderful way to, to, keep the nature happening and not be de destroying what is is something that you might have to cart away, pay someone to cart away. I'd much rather use it in my garden. I think it's a much better option. Okay, JBVRM Belinda saying good morning. Joined in late this morning. Not sure if you've given suggestions on how to control spider mites. Had a huge issue with them last spring. So uh, I haven't talked about spider mites yet. <clears throat> and this is one of those things so there are a lot of insects and spider mites fall into this category. Aphids fall into this category. There are a lot of insects that a good strong spray of water is your or should be your initial response because you can you can seriously disrupt the life cycle of spider mites and aphids and a lot of those small soft bodied insects by just spraying them off the plant. And if you think about it, these really small bugs like that, when they fall off the plant after having been sprayed off, first off, they're falling the equivalent of like a 50 story building, impacting the ground, and they're probably going to damage their legs and their body, if not outright kill them. So they're not gonna be able to crawl back up to the plant. That's why it tends to be so effective. You just spray them off and that kills or severely wounds them to the point they're not going to damage the plant. So that's that's one control. I, I don't use a lot of horticultural oils uh, or like neem oil. I will use neem oil inside you know, on my house plants if I have a problem. But that's also a way to control some of these insects is to use something like neem oil, which which is made from the neem tree and is a pretty effective way to deal with some of these these insects as well. You do have, it, it is really cool. Look, 
do some research this week into neem oil to see how it works because it it it's like a hallucinogen for a lot of these insects it has to be on something they're going to ingest and then it gets in their system totally disrupts their their system to the point that they kind of forget to, to, to eat and so for some of the insects neem oil actually screws with their little insect brain to the point that they end up starving to death and it it affects different insects in other ways some of the horticultural oils are actually uh, there to suffocate the insect by coating them with the oil so they can't breathe so there are a lot of those natural controls and those are some of the ways to deal with something like spider mites but but whenever i i haven't had a problem with spider mites in my garden i've seen them show up a couple times and when you have like lace wings the predatory insects that come in they'll often deal with insects like that and a good spray of water is often enough to deal with insects like that and 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 so when we talk watering i'm asked this a lot i like to hand water most of you know this i like to go out and water my garden by hand every morning and that gives me the time to look at my plants and see if an insect is coming in. That's why I can pluck off some of these insects. You know, they might be the scouts that are being sent out to try to find those weak plants. And if I can pull them off the plant and keep them from sending out their pheromone signals to the rest of their insect buddies, I'll do that. And also because I'm hand watering, if I see something that can just be sprayed off the plant, like a spider mite, I'll do that as well. And so, uh, get to know your plants face to face on a personal basis daily and you can really help keep some of these pests from ever creating a problem in your garden and that's that's really a good way to do it and so yeah David raises a good point so for indoor plants like the marijuana growers spider mites are a different uh, issue and and often you have to be careful particularly for for uh, a, a big crop that you have growing inside. Uh, circulation, air circulation can make a big difference. Humidity makes a big difference, but a lot of indoor plants, you can't take the hose in and spray them off. So yet another reason to really get up close and then start learning more about the insecticidal soaps in addition to the horticultural oils as a way to deal with a lot of the insect pests that you have indoors. I had uh, a scale. A type of scale that was on some of the plants I was growing at, at the Galileo school and uh, had to get in I was using a combination of those type of things neem oil was working fairly well but not enough and so I I got rubbing alcohol and went through every leaf and and it was a lemon tree just to be specific and so I had the scale that was on the lemon tree leaves and stems and I just took a little piece of cotton with rubbing alcohol and went through every leaf and every stem to get rid of the scale on that plant and then had to stay with it to make sure that they didn't come back and reinfest it. So uh, that's one thing to do. Um, there the the difference between the indoor pests and the outdoor pests they might be very similar insects but some of the controls really do end up being a, a, a bit different uh, hydrogen peroxide is another one of those ways that you can deal with the insect pests indoors outdoors i think it would just take so much hydrogen peroxide that it's not worth it but either pouring hydrogen peroxide on the soil to kill some of these eggs and larvae or the hydrogen peroxide on the leaves is another way to deal with some of the pests inside the household so you can see there's two worlds that you have to learn depending on how many plants you have inside and how many plants that you have outside and it's one of those things that uh, we can we can spend all kind of time learning and there's always going to be more to learn cam says uh, azadra azadaractin I think that might be how it is is a systemic that's derived from neem seeds and concentrates the active ingredient in plant tissue disrupts the life cycle and discourages feeding there you go so um, I haven't actually used that as a systemic but yeah the chemical that that is in the neem plant 
like I said earlier, totally disrupts their feeding. And it's, it's pretty effective for those plants that are going to be chewing on the, the, or those insects that are going to be chewing on the plants, either the stem or the leaves. And so in a systemic form, that's actually a really nice way to approach it. Jean-Pierre, bonsoir. I have a problem with beet flies, but I live in an area where farmers growing mostly sugar beets. This is a beet fly paradise. And so this might be one of those things, uh, if you're trying to grow the beet root in particular, and I'm not, you know, I'm guessing that's, that's their primary food. And so if you're growing not a sugar beet, but a, a different type of beet root in your garden, you might want to think in terms of the sacrificial aspect of it. Put some of the beets around the perimeter on the side that's close to the farmers. And if those insects discover your garden, they're going to attack those plants first. But beets fall into that category of plants that you can protect. And so the approach I would probably take is to grow my beets in a bed that I could keep covered with the, the fabric row cover. And that way those insects could never get to my plants to, to eat them at all. So consider that Jean-Pierre, actually putting that barrier up to, to keep them out. <clears throat> and hopefully you won't have problems with the bee flies because the, the beets, you don't need them to flower. You don't need a pollinator for the beets. So you can keep them covered their entire lifespan and still harvest them. And if no insect has ever got to them, then you're not going to have a problem with those beet flies anymore. Okay, rolling right along. Ladies Garden Home. I've had good luck with fungus gnats by boiling water in the potting mix before sewing and Ceylon cinnamon sprinkled on top. Good suggestion. <clears throat> I actually showed that in a recent video where I was making my potting mixes. Great way to deal with fungus gnats. Now the fungus gnats will lay their eggs in your potting mix. And so putting the boiling water on your potting mix is a great way to kill those eggs and any larva that might be hatching. And then cinnamon is that has antifungal properties. And so the moist potting mix is going to generate the fungus and that's really what's attracting the fungus gnats, hence the name. And so the cinnamon really can be effective at not necessarily killing or harming the fungus gnat, but actually taking away their food and sprinkling it on the surface of your your, your trays where you're growing your seedlings really can be effective. So thank you for those tips. Those, that is good advice. They really do work. Uh, okay, let's see. Chris, nice to see you back. Is there any way to make my yard a bad place for mosquitoes? Yes. So the best way to keep your yard a bad place for mosquitoes is to take away the water sources. The, the mosquitoes are looking for those wet areas to lay eggs. And if you can take away those wet areas, they're less likely to congregate in your garden. Or, because I think every garden should have a water source for all of the beneficial insects and animals, this is where the Bacillus thuringiensis that's made for mosquito larva comes in. You can get some of those little discs to put into any water sources that you do have, but it, it, especially after a heavy rain, if you've got low areas of your garden that tend to pool up, that's the area that you want to try to keep dried, improve your drainage, keep water from pooling, and then in a water uh, fall or, or any type of fountain that you have, you would want to use something to try to keep the mosquitoes from laying their eggs and the larva hatching. That's, that's a great way. Another thing, like we talked about earlier, if you can be attracting all of those wonderful snakes and lizards and animals that would be eating mosquitoes, that's another great option. I haven't grown citronella. You could probably grow cit citronella in your garden. And you can buy the citronella candles that, that do have some beneficial effects to keep mosquitoes away. And I've read that citronella plants can actually do that as well. So there's an option to start looking at some of the plants. Uh, and, and then bats. If you can attract bats, I've talked about this, I'm still a ways away from doing it, but if you can build a bat house in your, your landscape to attract bats, 
bats will devour mosquitoes at night as well. So, so some of those kind of methods, trying to get that, that whole natural system in play is one of the ways that you, that you can deal with mosquitoes. Hope that helps out a little bit. Some of the things that you might be able to, to do. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, yeah, hi, Cam. Actually an agronomist and ag consultant, works both organic growers and conventional growers. Went to MSU and have a degree in fruit and vegetable crop management. Awesome. Nice to have you here today. Appreciate you being involved and helping out with the information. That's awesome. Oh, this is, that's what makes this community and these live streams so awesome is, is the fantastic people. And, and I, you know this, I say it every week, just how fantastic everybody is in this gardening community from all around the world. And we really do have a lot of people that know what they're talking about, in addition to people that are trying to find out. So that's what's so great. Whether you're a brand new gardener and asking a question or someone with experience and credential credentials answering questions, we can all be gardeners enjoying our time. Patricia is saying, would it be helpful to disturb the soil under the deck where I have my container garden to disrupt or kill harmful larvae? I think so. And this is actually one of those methods I like to use when I think I have a problem. I don't necessarily do it every year, but this, this comes back to the identification of the pest. And so some of these pests, some of these bind borers, for instance, will the larva will actually overwinter in the soil. And there's a number of insects that will overwinter in the soil. If you know you have that particular type of insect, then yes, disrupting the soil can have a huge impact. I, I did that uh, this last year. I, I had a lot of grubs, didn't know exactly what kind of beetles they were going to turn into, but a lot of grubs in my beds and the chickens like to eat grubs, so I'd dig out the grubs and throw them to the chickens. But, but that's the idea, is that I'll amend my beds in the fall, primary purpose to feed the soil so that it's ready to go with all the beneficial soil microbes in spring. But in an area where I suspect there might be an insect problem, I'll also amend in spring. I'll add another couple inches of compost, work it into the soil, and by doing that, that will disturb the larva in the soil. And that's, that's what I did in my squash bed this last year, just in case I hadn't seen any indication of vine borers, but I did it just to be safe. And I dug up a whole bunch of grubs and threw them to the chickens over on the other side of the fence. So yes, now, would it be helpful? It depends on whether you have one of those type of pests. If you want to amend the soil, and it's not too much work to do it, then I say do it. The, the biggest issue is that whenever you're disrupting the soil, you are disrupting the life within the soil. And that's the concept behind the, the no dig gardening is that you're not disrupting that life in the soil. But it may be necessary if you have a pest that resides in that soil. So back to the very first point identify your pest and that will probably give you the answer you're looking for as to whether you disrupt and kill the larva in that particular area. Otherwise, I won't say it's a waste of time, but it may not be necessary. If the reason you're doing it is to disrupt the larva, then you got to be sure that you have a larva that's there to disrupt, if you can follow that. So El Valcaro 555, I put up a bat house several years ago and they absolutely hammer mosquito populations. Thank you for substantiating that bit of information. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I've mentioned this before. It's in my plans to put up a bat house. In the summer, I'll, look, I'll typically see three or four or five bats flying around my neighborhood in any given night. And so I'm hoping I can put up a bat house and actually uh, encourage some of them to reside in my garden space. But you're, you're absolutely right. I appreciate that as well. Bats are incredible when it comes to, to dealing with a lot of those type of insects that are going to be flying around. So really good idea. 
So Karen's saying, not sure if you'd mention what to do for grub worms. I had them in my garden last year, so I was wondering what to do this year to keep them away. Okay, so I just I talked about grub worms. So actually, uh, uh, nematodes are on my list of things to talk about today, too. There are a lot of beneficial nematodes that you can buy and put in your soil, and those nematodes will feed on some of these various larvae that will be in the soil. And so... The nematodes will usually, when you go to buy a nematode, it will identify what it likes to attack. And so you can buy specific nematodes for specific types of larvae and grubs. And so that's one way, like I mentioned, disrupting the soil or bringing in your flock of chickens. The chickens are going to dig up the grubs without you making any effort. <laughs> that's actually how I discovered I had the problem because I had some of the chickens jump the fence and start digging up that bed. And once I got rid of the chickens, then I started digging up that bed and disrupting the grubs. So digging them up, adding nematodes are a couple easy ways to deal with those, the, those grubs. Now, that being said, there are a lot of beneficial insects that are going to be in your soil as a grub. There are some good beetles and those beetles might lay eggs and have a grub in the soil as well. And so uh, beetles can play an important role in the whole ecosystem. And so don't automatically assume that a grub is a bad grub. I was doing it more just to keep the chickens out and to help keep them happy and disrupt any potential uh, problem. But, but like I said, I didn't take the effort to actually identify what kind of grubs I had because I'm still building out my garden space and, and learning what is coming to my garden. But uh, nematodes are, are actually, they fall in that category of like the, the BT, where it's, it's a totally organic, natural way to deal with some of these pests that might find their way to your garden. Prepper Chris, thank you for that contribution. Appreciate it. Helped out a ton. Going to do all four. Thank you again. Well, cool. Good. I hope that that all works to your benefit. Uh, nobody likes mosquitoes in our landscape in the summertime when you're trying to have a nice barbecue or sit around the fire. So, okay, let's see. Patricia says, I have margin blister beetles and tomato hornworms. Okay. And so, like I mentioned earlier, in particular, the tomato hornworms, um, the BT can be very effective for that. But uh, I'm not familiar as familiar with the blister beetles. But uh, look into the possibility of some nematodes if... Those, beetle, those beetles are laying grubs. And, and also back to the barrier system. If you find that you have beetles in a particular bed, the, the, the hoop and the cover over that bed, I talked about actually using that to keep the insects from coming in. You can do the same to keep the adults from getting out. So if you have a serious problem in a particular bed and you suspect that you've got something like the blister beetles and you want to keep them from infecting the rest of your garden, cover the bed and now they can't get out. And as an adult, they're much easier to, to get control over. So you, you can look at it both ways when you're dealing with barriers and trying to deal with insect pests. Keep them out or keep them in so that you can uh, focus your energy on where they're going to be. Okay. Rolling right along. Uh, yeah, Cam says those scarab beetles will overwinter in your, your lawns. And so uh, in a lawn, it's, you, it, you really can't get in and disrupt the soil. You might be able, if you aerate the soil in the spring, to get some of them. Uh, but, but yeah, that's one of those areas where you'll often see spraying to get rid of the grubs that are growing in lawns. But nematodes... Uh, are, are also an option if you can find the right kind of nematode. The, the scarab beetles are really cool beetles, but those grubs can cause a lot of damage if they do come in. Okay, let's see what else we have. I'm gonna just scroll through and see if I missed some recent comments. Um, oh, Pepper Chris says, state has a whole bat program in Tennessee. That's awesome. That's incredible. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jay. Jay's always on top of things, giving a nice link to an article about nematodes as pest control. 
that's awesome as well and Brian says worm castings from the worm bins are full of the beneficial nematodes so uh, that's also that's an interesting way to if you have a, a worm farm and you're growing worms that's actually a, a nice way to to spread some of that bacterial or fungal or nematode into other areas of your garden is to incorporate them into your worm bin in the bedding and the food and when you harvest the worm castings all of that wonderful life is going to be in the worm castings as well urban chicken mom is asking are frogs good or bad for the garden I have a water reservoir behind me that they live in and migrate over to my yard another in the, in that category of lizards and snakes the frogs are going to be eating those insects so yes they are beneficial for the garden the frogs are not going to eat your plants they're going to eat the insects on your plants now they are indiscriminate and they can eat the beneficial insects as well as the harmful insects the pests but yeah they can be really good for your garden and and that's one of those I use snakes as as an example that I've talked about before when I see snakes appearing in my garden I know that I'm starting to reach that equilibrium point that my garden is a welcoming environment for snakes and that those snakes now are taking care of the slugs and the snails and some of the other pests that I might have showing up in my garden I don't have the snakes yet because I still have a lot to do in my garden to attract the snakes frogs fall into that category as well if you have the water resources and the protective areas the shelters for the frogs then it's showing that you're doing a lot right to reach that balance and bring in those natural predators so yeah frogs are, are definitely good for the garden and I would encourage them at every point now one of the things I did want to talk about as well is you can buy insects for your insect pests buy some of those insect predators but I would suggest be careful don't expect a, a, a miracle overnight and so ladybugs are, are a really good example you can buy bags of ladybugs release them in your garden with the intent of dealing with the insect pests in your garden like aphids the problem is because of the type of insect that it is ladybugs are not going to stay in your garden now water your plants because they're probably going to be dehydrated and they're going to want to lick up all the water droplets off your plants as soon as you release them but the ladybugs are going to fly away they're going to they're they're going to look for their home ladybug ladybug fly away home that's what they do so they're only, only going to be in your garden for a brief period of time it's great fun for the kids but don't expect that buying a bag of ladybugs is going to solve your problem some of them may stay and over time you may develop a larger population of ladybugs within your garden but it's not a magic fix you can also buy mantids like a praying mantis you can buy those eggs and put them in the garden that's a better way to do it if you can buy one of these predator eggs and put it in your garden when they hatch they're going to stay in your garden unlike the adult ladybugs like the frog the mantids are indiscriminate they're going to capture whatever insect is in front of them whether it's a good bug or a bad bug but that is another option as to what you can purchase like the nematodes and the bt to deal with some of these pests so um, think about that it's 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 enjoyable to see the pr progress if you buy some of these eggs and you can see this little praying mantis emerge and suddenly it's taking care of your garden I tend to think that for most of these beneficials you can attract them and so for those of you that have been watching my videos for the last two and a half years you've seen that at this new house I started with nothing I literally scraped everything away leveled out the landscape started building the beds putting the trees and the and the fruit bushes in there was nothing here last year I saw three of the praying mantids in my garden and they are amazing 
I had a brown one on the plants that were brown, and I had green ones on the plants that were green. So they're going to find your garden. If you stay away from those chemicals, if you make your garden an inviting place with the shelter and the water and the food, they're going to arrive. And so it's it you can try to take the fast approach, which may or may not be effective by buying some of these things or just building the environment and they will naturally find your landscape. And so when I, I, I think I showed it, actually when I, I have a video on spinach seeds and I think I showed one of the praying mantids in that video because as I was collecting the seeds from my spinach plant, it was right there doing its job, taking care of the bad bugs that were uh, on the turnip plants actually nearby. So wonderful thing to do. Uh, <clears throat> Melissa says, hard to attract them here since I'm a balcony on a condo property that is basically a wildlife reservoir. There's so much competition, I have to bring them here. And, and so, uh, uh, yeah, like Christine says, uh, the, uh, track the attraction works, they will come. There are a number of different ways to attract a lot of the beneficials. And so, like I briefly mentioned, herbs, dill and fennel are incredible plants that you can grow to attract some of these beneficial insects. And so even if you have a small space, consider trying to add some of the, the flowers and the herbs that might attract some of those beneficial insects as well. You might have more trouble attracting the beneficial animals, but but you can attract some of the beneficial insects and, and also weeds. Don't necessarily indiscriminately spray herbicides to kill your weeds because a lot of what we think of as a weed is an ideal magnet for these beneficial insects. The first place, almost invariably every year, the very first place that I see my first ladybug is on a dandelion flower. And so I know my dandelions are attracting the ladybugs because of those other small insects that are going to be attacking the dandelion flowers that the ladybugs are coming after. So I'm not spraying my ladybug or my dandelions. I'm letting my dandelions grow because I know the ladybugs are going to find those dandelions before any of the other flowers in my garden or any of the other plants are growing. So weeds can be an important factor in attracting the beneficial insects as well. And it's it's that concept of equilibrium. It's getting all the plants and insects and animals working together and weeds play a part in that. So um, grow some weeds. Okay, let's see. Llama Llama is saying, someone used to say, why would I waste garden space on flowers? Uh, I cannot begin to tell you how much of a difference it's made. Cool. This year, my flower list has gone on steroids. Absolutely beautiful. That's the approach I like to see. And that's what I'm doing too. I've actually got way more flower seeds started in, in my basement than I do the vegetable seeds yet. And I, I will be growing way more flowers than I'll be growing the tomatoes and the peppers and those other kind of plants. So good. Yeah. Put your flower list on steroids if you want to get to the point where nature's taking care of your problem for you. Because it really is pretty cool to, to have nature deal with your problem so that you don't have to deal with your problem. That's what I learned at Galileo. In that, and I've said this before. In the fourth year, we essentially had no insect problem because nature was taking care of it for us. Now, we had snakes and we actually had salamanders that, that would come up from a creek nearby. We had bats. We built a bat house. So in addition to the bird houses, we had a lot of nature taking care of those insects for us. And it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. Not having to worry about plucking off the insects from the plants because I rarely would see an insect on the plant. So uh, awesome way to approach it if you can. So uh, I and I, I don't want to brag, but my neighbor is a beekeeper. Well, brag about it. That's cool. Uh, the, the bees are always a nice thing to have. And I think it's one of those things that if your neighbor's got bees and you've got a garden, it's a match made in heaven. So Sandy's saying, I have hummingbird feeders in my garden and I'm worried about praying mantises killing them. Uh, so, um, you know, I... I have heard that that the praying mantids 
can kill the hummingbirds. I've never seen that. I haven't seen evidence of it. The, the primary food of those are, are insects. And, and unless you've got huge mantids and small hummingbirds, it's really not going to be an issue. And, and the way we see hummingbirds fly, they can flit away from it. So I, I'm not going to say it's a myth because it probably has happened, but I don't think it's anything to be worried about. And so your hummingbird feeders are hanging and the mantids are probably not going to be on your feeder hunting the hummingbirds. They're going to be on your, your spinach and your tomatoes and all of your other plants hunting a much smaller, easier prey to catch. And so uh, I, I appreciate that sentiment that you're worried. Have your hummingbird feeders and also hope that you're attracting the mantids and they should actually work in harmony pretty well together. So Yvonne saying, loving today's show. Wonder how native plants fit into the scheme and how you plan to do a show or a video on native plants. Good question. So yes, I am actually planning on talking about native plants. It's on my list. I think in the May time frame when I actually am putting some of the native plants I'm growing out in my garden and when some of the native plants I have come back for the winter. So it is part of my plan. And so, so great question as it ties in with the subject today. The, the pests you have are likely to be native to your area. Now we all know about pests from other countries that are brought into our country and wreak havoc. So native pests are likely to have a native predator. That's just the way that nature works, <coughs> which is why these, these, these pests from another country end up causing so much problem because there isn't a natural predator to deal with them. And so if we have the natural or the native pests with the native predators, chances are there are native plants that are attracting those pests and native plants that are attracting those predators. Many of those predators are going to be laying eggs on the plant or in the, 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 the dead stems. And so it, it, it's a whole cycle depending on the type of, of insect. So yes, planting native grasses, native perennials, native trees can often be a critical factor in attracting those beneficial predators that are going to deal with those native pests. So uh, I, I am planning to talk about that when I talk about, that's just one aspect of the native plants. So the video I'm planning where I'll talk about native plants, uh, there'll be other aspects of why you should have a native plant, but that is one of the aspects is that it, it helps keep that loop and so your your native pests don't get out of control and 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 where you'll see this and this is one of those things that that we'll often see in a vegetable garden where you're you're growing the hybrids you're growing the heirlooms you're growing the plants from someplace else that aren't necessarily native to your area and then you get a, a pest, and it might be a native pest, but they really like that new plant that you've brought in. Well, the beneficial insects might not be familiar with that new plant yet, and that's one way and one reason why some of these pests can devastate our gardens when we try something new that really isn't native to our area. Until everything gets in balance, it just doesn't work. And so if you're not growing the perennial native plants and grasses and trees, then all you're focused on in your vegetable garden is just your vegetable plants. You can have a system out of balance and the pests can take over. Grow your natives because they'll deal with your native pests, even if they're feeding on some other plant that is not native to your area. So that can be a way to, to get the balance is to to not focus on just doing a vegetable garden. Put all the rest of these plants in and put these plants in around your vegetable garden, in your garden beds, it, like we're talking about with the nasturtium and, and dill. I have dill growing all over my garden 
for the purpose of attracting some of the beneficials. Even if I'm not planning on harvesting any of that dill, it's purely there nestled next to my tomato plants and my cucumber plants, hoping to attract some of the plants that are going to deal with the pests that I have. So, okay, let's see what we have. Um, Christine is saying hummers will avoid mantis. The mantids will look for the bees, bees on the feeders, and you can move the feeders to different locations occasionally and keep them clean and fresh. Okay, thank you for that. That That's what I suspected is that, that, that the birds are not going to put themselves in that position and the mantids aren't going to waste their time on a bird. But uh, I thank you for saying that. that that's nice to know. Uh, okay, and thanks, Jay. I always appreciate you trying to get the support for the Gardener Scott channel. So yeah, if you are benefiting from the information today, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I, I'll, I'll send out information that that will often only get to subscribers. It doesn't go out to everybody at YouTube. And if you click on the bell every week, I'm coming out with two new videos. And so that's a good way to see what the videos are and stay right on top of it. And then of course, we've got the channel membership that you can join for extra perks. And uh, if you'd like, you can do the super chat like you've seen before. That's a good way to make sure that I answer your question. And then the Gardner Scott store with t-shirts and mugs like my Gardner Scott Enjoy Gardening mug from the Gardner Scott store. That's where I got it. And then, yeah, I've got links to Amazon and Greenstock. And uh, I appreciate that for reminding everybody you're, you're on top of it. I really do like the work of Jay and Heidi every week as the moderators to keep this group a wonderful group. And as live streams grow, I have to admit, this really is great with the comments and the chat and everybody is nice to each other and helping each other. You guys are just fantastic. And and Jay and Heidi really do play a big role in that. So that's wonderful. Just Jessica saying, would it be a good idea to get beneficial bugs for a small container garden? Uh, sure. And so th the way I do this, um, again, if you buy them, they might not stay. But I, I will be doing it in my new greenhouse. I did it at the Galileo greenhouse. I also do it when I have containers uh, on my deck or patio that are separate from the main garden area. And that's when I see a ladybug or a bunch of ladybugs on the plants. I'll capture them in my hands gently and take them over to the container garden. Now this will work best if you know that there's already food in your container garden. And so if you see some aphids, if you see some of these pests, you can capture something like a ladybug that's already in your landscape and move it into your container garden area and they can do their work there. So yes, absolutely. I don't typically try to capture the mantids, but you could do the same. And if you buy the eggs, then yes, put the eggs in your container garden and then when they hatch, they'll be living right there. But expect that they'll migrate to other areas where there might be more food. Because especially in a small container garden, once those beneficials have eaten all the bad bugs, they're going to move on. They need a food source and they won't come back until more bad bugs show up. And so just be aware for any garden size that if you have attracted these beneficials, that they move, they may move on. If, if you've got so many of them that there are no longer there, the food, the pests for them to eat, they're going to move on. But they know your garden, they know your area, and they'll return, or they've laid eggs for the next generation to deal with because they move on and the next generation will hatch and, and do its job. So uh, yes, it can work, uh, and, and I would encourage it to get as much out of it as you can. Colorado Bird Nerd, nice to see you again as well. With such great info. It will be my first year to grow Shishido peppers. Has heard me and many others love them. Just started them indoors. Awesome. Yeah, I just started them indoors this last week too. And I actually started more shishito peppers this year than I grew last year. I think I had eight plants last year, if I remember right. I'm planning on growing more this year because it really is a wonderful, wonderful pepper. So good for you. Thank you for that super chat. And I, I have no doubt you'll love them. I'm anxious to hear what you have to say about them. Uh, in the future. And Brian says, uh, I just started my shishito peppers two weeks ago for the first time as well. Awesome. And uh, 
I'm sure you'll like them too. It, it's, it really has become my favorite new pepper. Hi, John. Hey, back at you. Uh, and, and so as, as we talk about, um, or as I move on from some of these things that I just talked about, seeing, seeing that ladybug on the dandelion and now growing shishito peppers for the first time, one of the things, and, and you know this, I end all my videos and the live streams by saying enjoy gardening. Now, I recognize, especially if you're new to gardening and you start realizing how hard it is, that you might have to stop and think, well, what does that mean? How do I enjoy gardening? It, there's too much to know. It's too hard. I'm in a challenging environment. I don't even know what to grow. So how can I enjoy gardening when it's just so daunting and I don't know where to start? So here's what I want to leave you with today. Look at the firsts. And, and I would encourage you do this in a garden journal. I think garden journals are great for a number of reasons I've talked about before. But this year in particular, look for the first, the first everything. The first bee that you see in your garden. The first ladybug you see in your garden. The first flower that blooms. The first everything and this includes those harmful pests the first colorado potato bug that you see pop up on your plants pl pluck it off those squash bugs pluck it off that's enjoyable the very first one as we've talked about today is one of those things that you can see it deal with it and I feel good when I pluck off that first harmful insect of the season. I feel good when I see that first everything. The first raspberry, the first strawberry, the first tomato, the first of so many of the things you grow, I say, eat it in the garden. Don't take it indoors. The first radish that I pull out of the ground, I hose it off and I eat it right there on the spot. The first spinach that I harvest, the first pea pods that I harvest, I sit right there and eat them on the spot. That's a great way to enjoy gardening, is to really savor those moments, those first moments of the year. Because too often with the pea pods we just start harvesting the pea pods and fix them and eat them and don't think too much about it but there's a lot of work that goes into growing a pea pod and so savor the moment eat that first pea pod i love having my granddaughters in the garden and letting them be the first to eat some of these things from my garden it's the first smile on a child's face in my garden every year you see how you can you can do so much the first robin of spring the the first hummingbird that comes to your feeder the first hawk that you see flying overhead and you're hoping that it takes care of some of those voles or the gophers that are in your garden the first owl i've got an owl in my neighborhood and every time i see that owl for the first time i stop and i i just stare and, and I've done that for 30, 40 minutes, just watching the owl in the tree in my neighbor's yard and seeing what it's going to do. That's how you can enjoy gardening, is all of those individual moments that might be lost over the course of an, an entire gardening season. Don't lose those moments. Focus on those moments and recognize them for what they are. That, each of those are an, an important step in your gardening season because each of them identifies something that you've had a hand in. Planting the seed, taking care of the plant, attracting those beneficials, making your garden an encouraging spot for the predatory birds that are finding their way in. Like I talked about the bats, that first bat I see in summer flitting around right after dusk it, it's it's a fascinating moment so enjoy gardening by enjoying all of the little moments you have along the way and i'll challenge you 
And I'm planning on doing the same thing. I'll share it at the end of, of my growing season. But make this list. And then at the end of the season, maybe in winter when you're trying to look for something to do, go ahead and put your top 10 of all of the dozens of things, all of those firsts that you saw through the gardening season, make your top 10 of what you enjoyed most in your gardening year. And I, I think this is where it really can become even more enjoyable. Recognize what you have control over and what you don't have control over. And some of those things that you don't have control over, some of those natural events that occur, if you slow down and think about it, you may recognize that you really do have control over some of those events, like the first robin and the first owl and the first hawk and the first snake and the first frog and all the rest, because that's nature responding to everything that you're doing in your garden. So make your list, the top 10 firsts of your gardening season. And I bet you that'll also bring a smile to your face at the end of the gardening season. So it's a challenge for you to move forward. Big Mama, thank you so much for that contribution. I appreciate it. What type of flowers should I use in Florida area 9A, 9B? So I can't give you specific varieties to grow because I don't live in Florida or in zone 9. But this gets back to what I say all the time, and that's to get with the gardeners in your area, go to the nurseries, the garden nurseries in your area, check out the master gardener help desk. They probably have one, or at least a master gardener help line that you can call, and they can give you the very specific varieties that would do best for you in Florida. I could recommend flowers all day long, but it's the flowers that I've grown or the flowers that I know do well in Colorado and I can't guarantee that they would have any success in Florida. So you have to look for your own sources and your own recommendations. And I'm sure that you can find uh, the, the, the pamphlets, the guidelines. I know here in Colorado, our extension service through the University of Colorado has fact sheets specifically listing all the flowers, all the trees, all the grasses, all the vegetables, separate fact sheets for each category of the plants that will grow here in Colorado. And I have no doubt that Florida Extension, probably the University of Florida, it might be Florida State, I'm not sure which school it would be, but whichever one is, has the oversight of your Extension program, they should have fact sheets that list all of those plants, specifically flowers in this case, that uh, you would be able to grow and that you could have success with. So look for that information locally and you'll have more success than me or any other YouTuber recommending what it's going to do best in your garden. Uh, talk to the gardeners near you and they'll tell you what does best in the garden. Welcome to Blue Roses Diane F. As a new member to the Gardener Scott community as a member. Appreciate that. Look for all those perks and there's a lot of stuff happening on the the channel membership Facebook page with pictures and videos and all kinds of stuff. So I encourage you to check that out. Okay, I'm scrolling to make sure I haven't missed anything, but I want to say thank you. And I hope that the information today really does encourage you to take maybe a more natural, more native way to deal with some of the pests. But first of all, and now lastly, identify the insect to determine whether it's even a pest at all. And as you see each of those new insects appear, try to figure out what it is, put it on your list as the first sighting of that particular insect, and I bet you it'll make you a better gardener along the way. I'm Gardener Scott. Great to have you here on a Monday. We'll see you next Monday. Enjoy gardening.